So in today's uh, talk, I want to tell you or try to convince you that hyperbolic geometry is uh, nothing more, nothing less than projective relativistic geometry. So I, about 100 years ago, Einstein um, introduced special relativity. And then a few years later, Minkowski uh, reframed it in the form of a four-dimensional space-time theory. So instead of thinking about a three-dimensional space and a one-dimensional time, we think of a four-dimensional space-time ruled by a quadratic form that looks a little bit like this. Now we're going to be talking about uh, relativistic geometry in one dimension lower. So the x and the y plane will be like for us our space, and our z-axis will be like time. And we'll have this quadratic form and this inner product. Now I remind you of a few familiar thing, objects in this situation. The uh, quadratic form takes value zero, giving us this cone called the light cone by physicists. When Q is equal to a positive number, we get a hyperboloid of one sheet around the light cone. And when Q is a negative number, we get a hyperboloid of two sheets inside the light cone. Now, in the 19th century, the uh, development of hyperbolic geometry was one of the, the highlights. And eventually, people realized that there was a natural connection with uh, relativistic theory, in that a model for hyperbolic geometry was this upper sheet of this hyperboloid of one sheet. So this object here is actually a Riemannian manifold sitting inside this Lorentzian situation. If you look at a tangent space at that point right there, then the tangent vectors are all space-like. That is, their quadrants is positive. So you can take their square roots and talk about their distance on, the, on this uh, manifold. The geodesics then turn out to be great circle analogs, the intersections of the hyperboloid with a plane through the origin, just the way a great circle on a sphere is uh, obtained by intersecting with a plane through the origin. Now, uh, it's more familiar to take a two-dimensional picture of this, and there are two possible two-dimensional pictures that are usually used. One is when we look at things from the origin, so we're looking up at this sheet, and we project onto the tangent plane at this north pole, this two-dimensional plane here. That's the, the Klein uh, picture. And there's another picture, the Poincaré picture, where you project from the south pole and you project onto an equatorial plane here, still looking at this fundamental manifold. So this gives us these two views. Um, and in the first view, the geodesics are straight lines. And in the second view, the geodesics are arcs of circles which are perpendicular to the boundary. Now, the, the Riemannian metric can be restated here in terms of some uh, projective geometry. So if we have two points, A1 and A2, then they also pin out two points, B1 and B2, on the boundary. And then if we take the cross ratio of A1, A2 with B1, B2, and then take a log and an absolute value and divide by two, then we get the classical distance, hyperbolic distance between A1 and A2. In the Poincaré model, it's a little bit similar. There's a formula involving a Cauch inverse function and some, a formula involving the standard distances between the points A1 and A2. We're not going to be looking at the Poincaré model so much. It's the projective model that's of interest to us. And our approach is to rethink hyperbolic geometry, to give a new formulation of it, which is entirely projective and algebraic. So we want to move outside the realm of differential geometry, and we want to pick hyperbolic geometry up and place it into algebraic geometry where it really belongs. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to look at uh, things from the origin. So we're going to look at lines through the origin in this, hyper in this relativistic space. But we're not going to restrict ourselves to looking just inside the light cone. Einstein taught us that although we cannot see immediately events which are outside our light cone, nevertheless, they are important because they ultimately influence us. Their light cones eventually intersect our light cones. So our point of view is to not prefer any portion of this. All the whole space is going to be important. It's going to be part of hyperbolic geometry as we're going to set it out. So let me remind you uh, first of just a, a few the definition of this cross ratio that I talked about, the purely projective quantity. If you have four points along a line, A1, A2, B1, B2, then you can introduce affine coordinates on that line. 
that is just regular kind of coordinates. And once you have coordinates, you can write down this quantity, A1 minus B1 over A1 minus B2, divided by A2 minus B1 over A2 minus B2. It's not hard to see that that's affine invariant, but it's a little bit more surprising that it's actually projectively invariant. That means that if you take any point O and look at lines like this, and take any other line, get four more points, then the cross ratio of those four points agrees with the original one. It's invariant. It's the fundamental projective invariant on a line. So we see that uh, in the Klein view, there's some co initial connection already with projective geometry and this hyperbolic or relativistic geometry. So sorry, that cross ratio is component-wise? I mean, taking the difference between two points? Yes, you just, you just take your line and then you, and then you put uh, some kind of scale on it. One, two, three, four, five, so some, some linear scale. And then with, with respect to that linear scale, you compute this uh, thing here. It doesn't then matter what linear scale you ended up choosing. All right, so there's some classical uh, results of hyperbolic trigonometry that I'll, I'll mention here that are found in all textbooks on this subject. There's a hyperbolic triangle in the Klein view with angles theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and distances or lengths d1, d2, d3. And here we have an analog of the sine law, and here we have an analog of the cosine law, and there's another different f formula, which is um, another kind of cosine law, but it has no Euclidean analog. So this formula allows us to calculate an angle if we know the three lengths. This formula allows us to calculate a length if we know the three angles. So these uh, three formulas are the basis for hyperbolic trigonometry in the classical sense. And for example, there are many secondary formulas. For example, there's uh, the parallax theorem known to Boulier and Lobachevsky, which says that uh, if you have a, a triangle like this with a, an ideal point at infinity, so these lines are somehow parallel, then this angle theta here, if this is 90 degrees, I should say, this is 90 degrees here, and then this angle being theta and this distance d, they're related by this expression here. This gives us also an absolute scale in, in the universe because there is, there's an absolute angles, uh, like you could take 45 degrees, and that would give you a, an absolute d that somehow canonically defined. All right, hyperbolic geometry is, is very rich, um, and we can see that by just, say, looking at equilateral triangles. There's a whole family of equilateral triangles, um, but they're all of different shapes. So the angles in equilateral triangle vary from 60 degrees, if you have infin infinitesimally small triangle, to as you increase, the angle becomes closer to zero in the case of an ideal triangle. And any intermediate value is allowed. In particular, you can cook up an equilateral triangle which has an angle of 2 pi on 7. Now, if you take such an equilateral triangle and reflect it in one of the sides, you can keep doing that, and then after seven times, you'll be back to where you started. So those seven equilateral triangles, they're all congruent. They fill up this little uh, corner. And then you can similarly extend this to a tessellation of the entire hyperbolic plane namely the interior of this disk. And associated with such a tessellation is a group of isometries generated by the reflections. And then it turns out that when you look at the quotient of the, the plane modulo such a discrete subgroup, you get a compact, non, a compact orientable um, manifold of genus 2. And all such are obtained this way. So surfaces of genus 2 all have canonical hyperbolic structures. And it's a, then a major development in 20th century mathematics that, that something similar happens with three manifolds. So Thurston has a, had a big program that uh, tried to put hyperbolic structures on, on um, three manifolds. And uh, that was uh, spectacularly resolved a little while ago by Perelman. Another implication here is to number theory and the theory of modular forms, where uh, the, the, the analysis of this subgroup uh, gamma has lots to do with number theory and uh, monstrous moonshine and many interesting things. The isometry groups, or the isometry group in this situation, it has various manifestations. One is as SL2, the set of two by two matrices. Another is in terms of Mobius transformations. Uh, so the picture that we're looking at is as SO21, the group of symmetries of this two plus one relativistic space. 
So all of these are more or less the same. And then there's another uh, interpretation of looking at projective transformations of the plane which preserve the interior of the circle, that unit circle. So relativistic geometry in this context here has a lot to do with projective geometry involving a circle and the connection there is the nature of reflections. So let's have a look at reflections. To understand isometries in a relativistic setting it's uh, easier if one works a little bit in lower dimensions. So let's have a look at uh, baby relativistic uh, theory. We have just uh, two coordinates x and y in the relativistic form x squared minus y squared. Then you've probably all seen uh, Lorentz boosts, which are the analogs of rotations in this context, given by matrices, cosh, shine, shine, cos, cosh. And these have the effect on the plane of, of rotating along hyperbola. So a little square like this gets rotated to a, a, a rectangle and then an even skinnier rectangle and stays adjacent between two adjacent uh, hyperbolas. It's an area preserving kind of uh, thing. But just as in uh, three-dimensional space, a, a rotation can be decomposed into two reflections, so uh, Lorentz boost can be composed into two relativistic reflections. And these are, some, in some sense, more fundamental um, and maybe more accessible objects. So let's have a look at, at them. So here again, in, staying in the two-dimensional picture, I've shown you the null lines, these dotted lines, they're the ones that have quadratic form zero. And I've shown you a, a vector A, or a line A, and it's perpendicular line A perp. So the perpendicularity is determined by this dot product. The dot product x1, x2 minus y1, y2 shows that the vector xy is perpendicular to the vector yx. And that geometrically means that a vector on this side is perpendicular to its reflection in the line y equals x or in the line y equals minus x. That's the meaning of perpendicularity in this context. It's a novel kind of perpendicularity, but it satisfies many of the usual properties uh, that we're so used to in the Euclidean context. So suppose we want to reflect this particular point x in this line a. To do that, we decompose x in terms of its coordinates. We have a component in a direction and the component in the a perp direction. So once we've decomposed it into its components, then a reflection in this line simply means negating the perpendicular direction or component. So this u component gets replaced with a minus u and the image of x is this point v minus u on this side. And it's not hard to see that that's still on the hyperbola that, the, that x was on, as it should be because this is a reflection and it preserves the, uh, the, uh, the structure. Now if we had reflected in A perp, then all what we would have done is, re is negated V instead. We would have ended up down here. And it's important to notice that the relationship between this point and this point is that they're still on the same line because one is just the negative of the other. So when you're looking projectively, the effect of reflecting in this line is the same as the effect of reflecting in the perpendicular line. That's a very important point. When we, when we work projectively, the effect of reflecting in a line or its perpendicular is the same. Let me draw that picture again uh, without so much clutter. So here's again the same picture and I've just shown you the line A, the line A perp, and the line through X and our reflected point X prime. Now, uh, it's an immediate consequence of the, the, what we did on the previous slide, that this is V plus U and this is V minus U, that in terms of projective geometry, these four points co are called a harmonic range. They form a harmonic range of points. Or in other words, this is the harmonic conjugate of this one with respect to those two points. And in projective geometry, that has a, a nice interpretation in terms of a quadrangle. So what that means geometrically is that if you take any uh, little quadrangle like this in the plane and you see where opposite sides intersect, and then you see where the other pair of opposite sides intersect, you get two points. And then when you look at the two other diagonals of this quadrilateral, 
you get two other points. Okay, and the relation is that these two points are harmonic conjugates of these two. And you can think that what it means is that this point divides this segment internally in the same ratio that this point divides it externally. So when we go to our th two plus one dimensional space, the picture is somewhat similar, but we have a little bit more room. So now we have um, a point or a line A, and now then it's perpendicular plane, in other words, the plane which has normal A, per normal in the relativistic sense, this plane will uh, have the, the kind of harmonic relation with, with, with the, the point uh, A. So in other words, if we l look at coordinates, if the point A has projective coordinates U, V, and W, because we're actually going to only be interested in the line through A, Okay, so if it's u to v to w, then this perpendicular plane is the one who's, who's, which has normal this. So it's given by the equation ux plus vy minus wz equals zero. There's a minus because we're using the relativistic quadratic form and not the usual uh, first year one. When we look at this entire picture in this sort of viewing plane of the z equals one plane, then we get a picture like this. So now our point A is really just a point, and that perpendicular plane is now this line. And what happens is that if this is the point UV, then the corresponding perpendicular plane has equation UX plus VY equals one. And it's a standard relation that this point and this line are related by the so-called pole-polar duality in projective geometry. In other words, if you look at tangents to the, to the unit circle at, from A, then those tangents meet exactly at the points where that perpendicular intersects the unit circle. And in terms of our reflection, the reflection in A perp or the reflection in A are the same in this projective picture. So to reflect x in this line, what we do is we find the harmonic conjugate of x with respect to these two points. So this and this are harmonic conjugates with respect to this, these two points. And because we're in one more dimension, we can use a straight edge to compute that in a nice way. We can take any line through x and see where it intersects the circle, and then those points there under the reflection have to go to the other points which are null on the same line. Because a reflection always has to take null points to null points. So this is going to go to that, and this is going to go to that, and so that means that this line here is going to go to this line there, meaning that our new point is the intersection of this line and our original line. It's a construction that's purely uh, done by straight edge. And we see that the relativistic perpendicularity is really just a pole polar duality when we look at it uh, projectively like this. Okay, so that was kind of a fast and furious um, introduction or motivation to a new way of thinking about hyperbolic geometry. Uh, I now want to uh, introduce this new type of hyperbolic geometry without any pictures, or at least with, so the pictures don't really uh, matter crucially. So it's a completely algebraic theory which works over a general field. And so in particular, it works over the rational numbers. So there's a hyperbolic geometry over the rational numbers. It works over a finite field. So there's a hyperbolic geometry over the finite field. Okay. So all of these, all of the theorems I'm gonna say are very uh, general ones. So our setting is motivated by what we've said up till now, but is somehow free of it. It's purely algebraic. So what is the definition of our point? And we're thinking of it being as a hyperbolic point. A point is just a proportion, x to y to z, enclosed in square brackets, we'll say. Okay. And what we think is we think, well, that's, that's the line in this, in this three-dimensional relativistic space going through the vector x, y, z. It's just the usual projective line through x, y, z. And a line is a proportion 
L to M to N in round brackets, so we can tell that it's a line. And that represents in our mind the plane which is perpendicular to the vector L, M, N in the relativistic sense. That's what a point and a line are. And then we uh, point out that there's possibility for these points and lines to be null. So a, a point is null if x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals zero in this context. And the line L is null if L squared plus m squared minus n squared equals zero in that context. In the Euclidean case, these are sort of empty definitions. But in the relativistic case, they are highly non-empty and they are crucially important. So null points and null lines are, are um, in this framework, uh, crucially important to the subject, not at infinity at all. They're right at the heart of the matter. <coughs> then we have a notion of incidence. We want to connect the point with the line. So we say that the line L passes through the point A. This line passes through that. Or equivalently, this point lies on that line, precisely when this little linear relation is satisfied. So when Lx plus My minus Nz equals zero, that's our, our key for saying that that point lies on that line. That's just telling us that, yes, this plane really does represent this, this plane. We have notions of perpendicularity also. So the point A1 and the point A2 are perpendicular when the dot product is zero. And the two lines are perpendicular when their dot product is zero. You're probably used to lines being perpendicular, but in this context, points are, can be perpendicular just as well. And then an important definition is the notion of duality, which is very simple. So we say that the point A is dual to L precisely when the two proportions are the same. In other words, when this vector A is actually the normal to this line L. That's our duality. One line being the normal to a plane. So, because uh, sometimes we, would, we do want, of course, to have some pictures, so let's connect this with uh, this sort of two-dimensional projective picture that we have. There's our unit circle representing our null points. There's a point A. In the x, y plane, uh, if we sort of mod out by z to get it in, in, this, in this plane, we would have x over z, y over z. So that's a way of assigning a, 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 a Euclidean point to a triple like this. And to the line L, M, N, we would associate the ordinary planar line with the equation Lx plus My equals N. Here's an example of uh, point A and its dual line A perp. Here's a notion of perpendicularity. Any line through A is perpendicular to its dual. So any line through A is perpendicular to A perp. And similarly, a, these two points are perpendicular. In fact, this point is perpendicular to any point on this, on this dual line. So that's our notion of perpendicularity. And now we come to the crucial notion of quadrants and spread. So we are taking the ideas from rational trigonometry, which I remind you reformulates ordinary planar geometry. Instead of having distance and angle, we have quadrants and spread. And that makes the entire theory algebraic and allows us uh, to generalize it considerably to other fields. So is that in focus completely? Is it all right? Okay. So uh, we have two points, A1 and A2, with obvious coordinates x1, y1, z1, and so on. We want to define a notion of separation between these two points. And these are actually lines in this relativistic space. That's what they're really representing. So if you have two lines in relativistic space, how are you going to assign a number that's associ that associates how far apart they are? Well, you, you have the dot product. So here is the dot product between the two vectors. But we want it to be homogeneous because these things are only defined up to scalar. So we want to have some numerator that will cancel. Uh, and so we obviously just sort of put the uh, quadratic forms of the two individual things there. And we make a, put this a 1 minus this in order to ensure that when the two points are equal, we get 0. 
Okay, if the two points are equal, then this dot product is exactly the same as one of these, and so this is one. So in that case, we'll get one minus one is zero. Correspondingly, when the two lines are perpendicular, then that's the case when this dot product is zero, and then the quadrants is one. So quadrants is, of zero means that they are actually equal. Quadrants of one is that they're perpendicular in the relativistic sense. Then we have uh, exactly dual notions of the spread between uh, two lines, and the formula is exactly the same, and uh, all the comments that I've made apply equally. Now, how do these two concepts of quadrants between points and spread between lines relate to the classical uh, definitions of distance, hyperbolic distance between two points, and usual angle between two lines? Well, here's the relation. The quadrants is minus the cinch squared of the distance. And the spread is the square of the sine of the angle. So this allows us to convert from one to the other if we want. But our framework here is much more general than this and much more elementary than this. Because there's no transcendental circular functions involved. And there's no notion prior of distance and angle, which are somehow Riemannian concepts. So we can work purely in, a, in, a, in an algebraic setting, but we can still capture most statements that have to do with distance and angle in this algebraic framework. And this turns out to be a, a profitable and powerful idea. Okay, so to give you some intuition as to what this quadrants uh, means, here are two points. So I, I, cho choosing the z coordinate to be equal to 1 means that we're effectively in the plane. Because so you just look at these first two coordinates. These first two coordinates uh, are both on the x axis. So you have two points on the x axis in the Klein picture. And here's the quadrants between them minus x1 minus x2 all squared over x1 squared minus 1, x2 squared minus 1. If x1 and x2 are both less than uh, 1, then this will be a negative number as we see here, because it's going to be negative. So inside the disk, we get a negative number for the quadrants. If one of them is inside, one of them is outside, then, then we get something positive. And here's some other examples. Here's the quadrants of a general point to the, to the center, to the origin, 0, 0. That's given by this. The ordinary Euclidean quadrants divided by quadrants minus 1. And here's another quadrants. This one here involves the point at infinity. This is a point at infinity. Uh, 1, 0, 0, that means it's sort of in the x direction at infinity. And I just remind you that there's a projective view, so our two-dimensional plane doesn't capture everything. There are also points at infinity. So to give you a little bit better sense of what this quadrants looks like, uh, so here's some pictures of, of circles. Uh, so let me try to explain this. So here is the standard in black, the standard unit circle, or the null points that we've been talking about. And here is some random point A inside the disk. And I'm showing you what circles around A look like. Okay, this is the same picture as inside the disk, it's the same picture as in the Klein model. What you do is you get ellipses. Okay. So, and I've labeled the ellipses by how, roughly how far they are, or what the quadrants is to A. Okay, so there's a roughly uh, there's something very small circle, and then maybe minus quadrants, minus one quadrants, minus three quadrants, minus 100. And as you approach the, the, the boundary, it goes to minus infinity. When you cross the boundary, you get an ellipse that goes outside, and that will have a big positive value, maybe 200. And then if you keep going, then those ellipses uh, at some point become a parabola. This is an intermediate parabola. And then after that, you get hyperbolas. <clears throat> and the hyperbolas are, have one branch close to here, the other branch is far away. And as you move closer to the dual line of A, which is this one here, these hyperbolas uh, come together and they start uh, zeroing in on, on this dual line. And so the quadrants is here, for example, are 1.5, 1.4, approaching 1 as we, as we get close to here. It gives you some sense of, of what the quadrants looks like. And down here, I give you a picture of the outside, which is quite different. So here now I've, again, here is the unit circle that representing the null points. And now I've chosen a point A outside. So what do circles around it look like? Well, it's quite different. 
let's start with the interior ones. <clears throat> the interior ones are are ellipses, but they're all ellipses which are tangent to where the the dual line meets the null points. In classical uh, classical hyperbolic geometry, these are called uh, sort of, uh, lines of uh, constant width or something like this. Okay. They, they play the role of circles, but here we see that they are in fact exactly circles, but the center is outside. Then as we get outside the unit disk, the circle, there's a, an ellipse that appear, and then these ellipses change at some point to becoming hyperbolas. And those hyperbolas then converge on the two null lines that go through A, the ones that are tangent to the null cone. And then there's a bunch of hyperbolas uh, up, up there as well. Quadrants is 0.3, quadrants, negative quadrants is minus 10, minus 5, minus 4, approaching 0. All right, so now we can do hyperbolic trigonometry. We can replace all the formulas most of the formulas in the classical books on hyperbolic trigonometry with new formulas involving quadrants and spread. And they are much easier to compute with because you can only, you can work with uh, pencil and paper. Although a computer doesn't hurt. So the first uh, two results are linear ones. <clears throat> Suppose we have three points A1, A2, and A3 which are collinear. That means they lie on a, on, on a line. Then there's three quadrants is formed, and our convention for quadrants is always the same. Q1 equals the quadrants between A2 and A3. Q2 is the quadrants between A1 and A3, and Q3 is the quadrants between A1 and A3, A2. In that case, these three quadrants satisfy this relation here, and this relation is also the triple spread formula in ordinary planar geometry. In other words, it's exactly the relation satisfied by the three spreads of a Euclidean triangle. Correspondingly, there's a, an exact dual situation where we have three concurrent lines, L1, L2, L3, and the three spreads formed by them satisfy exactly the same relation. In fact, there's a, a complete duality in the theory between points and lines, and so many of the results I probably won't, uh, I'll just give you one version of them and not give you the dual version. <clears throat> okay, here is Pythagoras' theorem in the hyperbolic setting. <clears throat> hyperbolic Pythagoras' theorem deals with a right triangle, so we need two lines which are perpendicular. So let's say that's one of our line. How do we get a line that's perpendicular to that? We find its dual point, which is there, and then any line through that dual point will be perpendicular to this one. So that is a perpendicular line. Let's choose that. Then we have a little triangle. We can choose three points inside or outside. It doesn't matter where the three points are. All these laws are independent of the actual position. So there's this triangle has quadrants Q1 here, Q2 here, Q3 here, and a spread of 1 there. <clears throat> and here's the relation. Q3 equals Q1 plus Q2 minus Q1 times Q2. That's Pythagoras' theorem in this uh, purely algebraic formulation of hyperbolic geometry. It has a, a dual formulation involving lines. So here we have three lines, and now instead of having two lines which are perpendicular, we have two points which are perpendicular. So suppose this point is perpendicular to this one. Geometrically, that means that this point lies on the dual of that one. So these two points are perpendicular, then the three spreads satisfy the same kind of relation, S3 equals S1 plus S2 minus S1 times S2. And of course, it's worth pointing out that these are deformations of the results for planar Euclidean geometry. In planar Euclidean geometry, there's no quadratic terms. Pythagoras' theorem is, of course, just Q3 equals Q1 plus Q2. Because in planar rational trigonometry, the quadrants is just the square of the distance. <laughs> Now, 
All right, now we come to a general triangle. So we have a general triangle, A1, A2, A3, and it has three quadrants, Q1, Q2, Q3, and three spreads, S1, S2, and S3. And here are the main laws. The first one is the spread law, which replaces the sine law. The next one is the cross law. And there's a dual cross law. These replace the two cosine laws. <clears throat> this one allows us to calculate a spread if we know three quadrants. Gives us a quadratic equation for a spread in terms of three quadrants. So it's Q1, Q2 times S3 minus Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus 2 all squared equals 4 times 1 minus Q1, 1 minus Q2, and 1 minus Q3. may look a little bit imposing, but it's, um, it's much preferable to calculate with pencil and paper than to try to work with shine, cosh, especially the cosh inverse. So if you have to do calculations with ordinary trigonometry, you always have to do approximations because your calculator only truncates. Here we can work in quadratic extensions and we know exactly where our answers are at all times. So Norman, what is this one exterior to the triangle? Why is which one? S1 experience. You mean in this diagram? Yes. Oh, when I, um, I just indicated this way. The spread between two lines really only depends on the two lines and not uh, any kind of ray direction. So it's, in, it's irrelevant whether I, I put the S1 here or here or, or here or here. All right, so you may remember that parallax theorem that uh, Bollier and Lobachevsky uh, discovered with the tans and e to the minus and so on. So here is the parallax theorem in, in this setting. So we have a, a triangle with uh, an ideal triangle. In this case it simply means that one of its points is, on, is a null point. <coughs> and we have still a perpendicularity right there. And there's these, these uh, quadrants are not defined because when, when you have a null point the denominators become zero so there's no, there's no thing defined there. Uh, we could say that they're infinite also. So these are the only two quantities that are defined in this setting. And the relationship is this one. Q equals S minus 1 over S. It's already a big clue that something's happening here that's a lot simpler than the usual setting. Another important observation, which is an immediate consequence of the spread law, is Thales' theorem. So it also concerns a right triangle, so, but now an, an arbitrary one. So here's a right triangle, A1, A2, A3, and I have a right angle at A3. So these two are perpendicular. So there's the quadrants Q1 on this side and the quadrants Q3 on this side, and let's consider this spread S1 right here. Well, the spread law tells us that S1 over Q1 equals S3 over Q3. And uh, if S3 is equal to 1, then we can rewrite that as S1 equals Q1 over Q3. So this spread here is determined by the ratio of opposite to hypotenuse quadrants. But the point is that it doesn't depend on which triangle we used. So if we used another triangle which had a right angle here, so in fact any line coming from here is, is perpendicular. So if we look at this point here and this point here, that's also a right triangle, then it's also going to be true that this spread S1 is this divided by this. That means that there's an aspect of similar triangles in this subject, which I think hasn't been properly uh, appreciated. That it's, it's not a full similar kind of triangle, but nevertheless, we can still we can get this kind of partial relation between triangles. <clears throat> All right, so um, now I'd like to talk a, a little bit about some, some extra theorems, some sort of dividends that one gets from having done this work. Um, one can then extract a whole bunch, a whole range of, of pleasant results, and some of them are, are, are new. Well, all of them are new in the sense that they extend to rational numbers, they extend outside the light cone, and they extend to finite fields. 
But other, some of them are new in the sense that they're simply new uh, even in the, in the classical context. <coughs> So the first one is a, an analog of a well-known result. If you have an equilateral triangle, three equal quadrants, three equal spreads, then we saw that there's a relation. There's a whole family of equilateral triangles. So if you know Q, you should be able to try to know what S is, at least up to uh, maybe a quadratic equation. And this is, in fact, the relation. So 1 minus SQ all squared is 4 times 1 minus S times 1 minus Q. And that works also when you have equilateral triangles outside. <coughs> there are quite a range of new theorems that involve null points. I call them sort of null trigonometry uh, results. So usually in, the hy in classical hyperbolic geometry, the circle is uh, considered to be a circle at infinity. And it's, it's recognized, of course, that it's very important, but um, somehow this has a little bit of a nebulous nature. In our system, the null points are just light cone, in, and they, it's uh, not a nebulous at all. It's a very important, essential aspect of the geometry. And so there's results that have relate to when certain points or lines are null points and null lines. <coughs> For example, uh, this is what uh, might be called null perspective theorem. If we have three null points and uh, we have a triangle formed by them, if we choose any point on one of the sides, so this point here is on one of the sides, and then we look at the other two sides, let's just choose any two lines through that point, and intersecting the other two lines and two points here and two points here. And the theorem is that the, this quadrants equals that quadrants, independent of where this point is and independent of where these points are. A related kind of result is uh, null subtended theorem. If you have a line two null points like this, another null point there, and then we choose an another line intersecting our given triangle of two points there and making a spread of S with that lot side there, then we get a quadrants Q between those two points and it turns out that this quadrants Q is related to this spread S in the almost simplest possible way, that S times Q equals one. So in particular, if you think of this point as being variable and move it around, then that quadrant stays the same. So in terms of classical hyperbolic geometry, it's still it's the same as the distance uh, being the same. Uh, one one uh, consequence of that is that it's relatively easy to duplicate length. Suppose we wanted to duplicate this length on this side over here. What we could do is we could just use this configuration and then we move this point here so that it's in line here like this. So if, we, if it's down there and then we go up like that, then that will cut out the same quadrants. So the point where that line reaches up there will be also the same length. And you could keep going down there like this and it's a little straight edge construction. You can immediately c construct all kinds of uh, copies of your initial segment on the same line. So you can make a ruler this way. And you can make a ruler uh, just as effectively if the line is outside as uh, inside. <coughs> Here's a result I call a butterfly theorem because it's, it's quite closely related to a classical Euclidean result called the butterfly theorem. So we have four null points and a, well, there's a bunch of lines that connect them, and there's a diagonal point, we'll call it G. And then through this point G, we draw any line L whatsoever. That line L is going to intersect this and this pair of opposite sides in two points X and Y. And the statement is that G is actually the midpoint of, of this X and Y independent of where this line L is. 
even if it's in this light direction up here. The, the standard Euclidean uh, butterfly theorem is a consequence, a special case of, of this. Here's another example of a kind of acute uh, phenomena that's uh, quite interesting. If we look at four points on the null, four null points forming a quadrilateral, so that's uh, like a cyclic quadrilateral, except that these are all null points in our hyperbolic geometry. Then such a quadrilateral has six sides. We can, there are six possible lines that we can draw between these four points. And those six uh, sides or lines intersect in three new points. Right. Then these new points are called the diagonal of the original quadrilateral. Of course, that, ha that works whether the quadrilateral is cyclic or not. But various remarkable things happen in this hyperbolic context with such a cyclic uh, situation. For one thing, what happens is that R, P, and this, no, sorry, this point, this point, and this point themselves form a rather remarkable configuration. They form what I call a completely uh, right triangle. What that means is that the three sides of this triangle are all perpendicular to each other. So there's a, a, there's a right angle there, 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 and there. That, that, that triangle has three right angles. And moreover, these, these things are all uh, mutually perpendicular. Or another way of saying that is that this point here is the dual of this line here and, and cyclically around. So a more remarkable fact, however, occurs when we look at these uh, three spreads which are formed at these diagonal points. So the two lines intersecting at each one of those points, so there's a spread, call the spreads P, R, and T. So I call this the 4864 theorem because independent of where these four original points are, PR plus RT plus TP always turns out to be 48. So 48 is a constant of nature. And P times R times T is 64. That's another constant of nature, independent of, any, of any, anything else. And finally, I'll finish with uh, a very mysterious theorem to me, which uh, is very completely remarkable to me, and it's a some a small miracle that I was able to sort of randomly discover this, and I I think that probably will lead to to many new investigations. It's I call this the jumping jack theorem. Okay, it's a jumping jack because it's a little bit like a a jet star person jumping. Yeah. So we have four. Oh no, we have five points on the null uh, circle, and we join them with lines. So there's a line, there's a line, there's a line, there's a line. And we look at this intersection of uh, that diagonal point G. And then through this point G, we draw a random line L. Okay, so that random line L will intersect uh, those two lines in points Y and W. And we'll let those points that are determined by the five be X and Z. So there are two quadrants that are formed. There's that little quadrant, we'll call it R, and there's that little quadrant, we'll call it S. And then it turns out that those two numbers always satisfy this cubic equation. 16 times R S equal times 3 minus 4 times S plus R always equals 1. That's independent. You can move these five points around at random and everything changes. But this relationship between these two spreads does not change. And this, okay, it's, it's interesting uh, for a number of reasons. It's a cubic equation for, for one thing and cubic equations don't so often come up in, in metrical geometry. Uh, and, but the, the cubic equation itself is, is rather interesting, at least it seems to me. Uh, there's its graph in the RS plane. It has uh, asymptotes here and here, and then one there. And then there's this isolated point. That's, that's the only, that's all by itself. That's one quarter, one quarter. Um, and I haven't done it properly. It should actually be further down here. It turns out that that's actually the centroid of the triangle of asymptotes. asymptotes. Um, so, um, 
I could properly explain this, and I imagine that there's probably a fair number of other results that are somehow related to this one. I feel that this is just, uh, just accidental bumping into some large phenomena, and I, I still don't know what this elephant really looks like. So I hope I've uh, convinced you that uh, thinking purely algebraically is a, is, a, is a rich way of thinking about hyperbolic geometry and probably leads to computational simplifications as well as, I think, conceptual uh, simplification. And I suppose uh, it validates, yet again, Einstein's uh, genius in, in, in recognizing that this, this quadratic form is so central to, to the world. And I'd like to, like to say that I think mathematicians should really be thinking a lot more about, about relativistic kinds of quadratic forms and the geometry associated with relativistic quadratic forms rather than this uh, predominant Euclidean orientation that we've, that we've really been having uh, so far. Thank you. <laughs>